Thank you all for joining us for our six Howard Mathematica panel discussion. I'm proud to introduce one of our six Howard Mathematica alums who will introduce our speaker. Thanks, Nanit. My name is Asha Yadav. I'm a PhD candidate in special education at the University of Oregon and a six Howard Mathematica 2022 alum. And I'm honored to introduce our panelist, Professor Charlotte Garden. Professor Charlotte Garden is a law professor at the University of Minnesota and specializes in labor law, employment law, and constitutional law. Her interests include the intersection of workers' rights and the constitution, and how law supports or undermine worker voice and power. Prior to coming to the University of Minnesota, Professor Garden was a professor at Seattle University School of Law, where she served as co-associate dean for research and faculty development. In 2016, she was a visiting professor at the University of Alabama School of Law. Professor Garden clerked for Judge Thomas L. Ambro of the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Third Circuit. She received her Juris Doctor from NYU School of Law and her BA from McGill University. Welcome, Professor Garden. The floor is yours. Well, I'm very happy to be here with you virtually, and I'm really looking forward to being with you sort of in person this summer. Um, I'm not a data scientist or a social scientist at all. Um, I'm a law professor. Um, before I started law, uh, before I started teaching, um, I was a labor lawyer at a firm that represented unions. Um, and that work really informs what I'm interested in today as an academic. So um, I tend to focus on how um, federal, state, and local law um, does and doesn't regulate work, um, how work law is and isn't enforced, um, and how uh, the law of workers' collective action um, sometimes promotes but also often undermines workers' abilities to come together to try to change their working conditions. So I'm going to start by giving you just a 30 second crash course in federal labor law um, and then talk a little bit about how federal labor law does and doesn't limit employers use of surveillance automation and algorithmic management. So when I say federal labor law, I mean um, a federal statute, the National Labor Relations Act, and that is the law of unionization and collective bargaining for most private sector workers. Um, and so I'm not going to talk about um, other ways that work is regulated, such as through anti-discrimination law or workplace health and safety law. Um, so after that, I will talk about how labor law relates to surveillance and algorithmic management, um, and also how those tools, um, when deployed by employers, can make it harder for workers to organize, um, even as they also make organizing more necessary by making workers more vulnerable. And then finally, I'll talk about virtual work in labor law, um, so how workers might um, organize and try to exercise their rights under the National Labor Relations Act when their work is virtual or when they work in real life, but consumers interact with their workplace from the kind of comfort of their own homes. Okay. So first, um, just a tiny bit about the National Labor Relations Act. So as at least, especially as originally written, um, the NLRA was explicitly a pro-unionization, pro-collective bargaining statute. Um, it was intended to respond to oppressive working conditions um, and it sort of explicitly thinks about how um, those working conditions harmed workers individually and also the economy as a whole. Um, and tried to respond to that situation by empowering workers to kind of come together and use their collective leverage to claw back from employers um, a greater share of the economic gains that their labor helped to create. Labor law's core protection is the second bullet point on the slide. Um, it's this just short declaration that employees have the right to self-organization, um, the right to unionize and bargain collectively, and the right to engage in other concerted activities, which admittedly is slightly vague. So one important word in this sentence is employees. 
Uh, the National Labor Relations Act covers most, but not all employees um, in the private sector. Uh, there are also some important exclusions there. Probably the most egregious exclusion is of agricultural and domestic workers. Uh, but the NLRA also excludes workers who are treated as independent contractors rather than employees. And that is important for or important to this presentation for um, reasons I will come back to in a little bit. So when collective bargaining um, results in a collective bargaining agreement, which is not all the time, uh, it works well. So on average, um, unionized workers make more money than their non-union counterparts. Collective bargaining tends to shrink both the racial and the gender pay gap. Um, and unionized workers also typically have um, other protections that don't exist in just kind of at-will employment, um, such as contractual rights not to be disciplined or fired without good cause. So, Today, right, a, you know, so despite the fact that collective bargaining, when it works, can work really well, um, today under 10% of private sector workers are unionized, um, but also a substantial percentage of workers who do vote to unionize um, never reach a first contract. So if we evaluate the National Labor Relations Act according to kind of its own stated policy goals, we would probably say it has it has substantially failed or it is substantially failing today. So when I talk about the scope of federal labor rights and how they do and don't protect workers, especially when we talk about uh, collective bargaining and collective bargaining over surveillance and algorithmic management, it's important to keep in mind that we're talking about like a very small percentage of workers who actually have those collective bargaining protections. On the other hand, when we're talking about just the sort of general right to engage in collective action, that right applies whether or not workers are unionized. So workers who are covered by the statute um, all have the rights to engage in protected concerted activity to use the statutory language, um, whether or not they've actually voted to belong to a union. Okay. So let me shift to talking a bit about labor law and workplace surveillance. Um, so the National Labor Relations Act doesn't say the word surveillance, right? It doesn't explicitly refer to employer surveillance, but um, it nonetheless does make it um, an unfair labor practice, so it's illegal, for employees, um, for employers to interfere with employees' rights to engage in, co in concerted activity. And the National Labor Relations Board, which is the federal agency that has primary responsibility for enforcing labor law, has pretty much always, during its you know, existence since the mid-1930s, has pretty much always considered some forms of employer surveillance um, to violate the act by interfering with workers' concerted activity. So if you're thinking of the Pinkertons now, um, that is exactly right. So the earliest um, cases about employer surveillance and employer interrogation of employees, which is sort of a closely related topic, um, arose out of things like employers hiring private detectives, right, hiring Pinkertons, um, to follow employees who were suspected union sympathizers to see if they attended union meetings, um, or employers might do things like stand near a picket line and kind of conspicuously write down who is participating um, or, you know, calling employees into their office and just asking them questions, you know, what's going on with this union drive, who supports it, who doesn't, right, kind of asking for a list of names. But the NLRA also applies when employers introduce kind of newer and more intrusive um, or at least more sort of totalizing um, forms of surveillance in response to collective action. So deliberate and otherwise unjustified surveillance of concerted activity violates the NLRA, whether or not the employees are aware of it at the time. And then it's also an unfair labor practice to attempt but fail to try to conduct surveillance of protected concerted activity 
um, or to create the impression of surveillance. So sometimes, you know, an employer will, you know, put up a video camera in the break room, but there's no tape inside, right? That could still be um, a violation of the NLRA. On the other hand, right, this is a huge caveat. Um, it is not an unfair labor practice for employers to sort of happen to see collective action while they conduct kind of what is for them a normal degree of surveillance, right? So normal refers to normal for the employer and not in line with kind of general social expectations about privacy. Although, of course, um, what becomes normal for many employers shapes people's expectations of, about privacy. So that kind of caveat comes about because the board asks whether the employer's conduct is kind of out of the ordinary and whether it's out of the ordinary in a way that would tend to interfere, right, with workers' collective action, right, would tend to kind of restrain them or coerce them. So recently, for example, the NLRB's prosecutor um, decided there wasn't cause to believe that Amazon violated the NLRA when it posted a job ad for an intelligence analyst, so the, the, the previous general counsel. Um, so Amazon posted an ad um, for an intelligence analyst and specifically said that this person's job would be to focus on labor organizing threats against the company. Uh, so the board's prosecutor thought that um, because there was a way for this job to be done um, that would be consistent with the National Labor Relations Act, that that means that reasonable employees wouldn't assume that their non-public concerted activity would be surveilled. Um, so, you know, when we talk about the National Labor Relations Act and its relationship to surveillance, right, it's sort of you, you sort of see the scope of its limitations when you think about a company saying, we're hiring somebody who is explicitly going to focus on labor organizing, that we view labor organizing as a threat, right? We obviously want to deter it, right? And that be at least arguably consistent with the act. Um, I should say, as kind of the caveat to the caveat, though, um, when we sort of talk about what is kind of normal surveillance for the employer, um, that kind of normal surveillance, right, or the surveillance the employer is already using for other reasons, uh, could still violate the act if the employer starts to use it in a way that's specifically targeted at discovering a union drive, right, discovering concerted activity. So, um, an employer that has a keystroke logger um, lo in place long before a union drive begins, right, could still violate the act if they start using it to search for the word union or the phrase living wage or something like that. Okay, so this has been the law, like I said, pretty much since the NLRA was enacted, but of course the amount of information that can be captured through workplace surveillance has exploded. So we've gone from Pinkerton's following employees to right, keystroke loggers, right, which have been common for you know, sort of decades now, um, to the beginning of a new era where it's possible to collect just massive amounts of data um, and then to sort of analyze it using big data techniques to find out all sorts of things about workers as a group, but also potentially individual workers. So this ranges from um, Amazon warehouses that track, right, how many packages each worker handles per hour, right? There is some kind of great ethnographic work about how that affects workers. Um, there, you know, there's RFID tracking that analyzes sort of where workers are, right? It can help employers figure out which employees are talking to which other employees. Um, companies at least claim to be able to monitor um, employees' happiness. Uh, they do that in part through tiny microphones that record and then analyze everything that employer, employees say throughout the workplace all the time. Um, they also say that they can analyze employees' tone um, to help figure out their kind of general mood. And then, of course, you know, rating systems uh, are increasingly ubiquitous for, um, you know, some job categories, uh, allowing companies to receive a kind of constant 
stream of information about how um, customers feel about individual frontline workers. So, uh, you know, the slide just has an assortment of headlines and patent applications. Of course, the existence of a patent application doesn't mean the technology is being deployed. Um, it just means that a company, um, you know, wants to have a patent or thinks they might be able to deploy the technology. Uh, the um, headline in red um, is about, uh, you know, tech companies surveilling their employees to try to prevent, you know, leaks to journalists. Um, and kind of similar, kind of, you know, sort of similar disclosures. Um, but one reason I like it is that it talks about uh, companies, again, using literal Pinkertons um, to kind of follow employees or eavesdrop in coffee shops that are close to, you know, Facebook's office or Google's office or whatever, um, to try to figure out like who, you know, who might be leaking. And so there's this kind of full circle, right? Employers are still using Pinkertons to figure out um, which employees are saying what to other people. So what does all this mean, right? What are some of the effects of workplace surveillance on employees? And, you know, obviously I'm looking at this through kind of the lens of labor law and labor organizing. Um, so one effect is, is exactly what you'd expect, right? Surveillance could deter concerted activity, right? Could deter employees from talking to each other um, about working conditions and problems they have with them and what they might do about those problems um, by just making employees fearful of retaliation, right? The boss will know and I'll get in trouble. Um, that can especially be true where, you know, the employer commits other unfair labor practices, um, where there's sort of an atmosphere um, of, you know, retaliation, right? Where employees see things that have happened to other people that they perceive as having been retaliatory, right? You can, of course, understand. Workers will say, I don't want that to happen to me. Um, workplace monitoring and surveillance algorithmic management can also have sort of more subtle effects to the extent they um, prevent employees from having downtime. So, you know, warehouse work where um, employers carefully monitor, right, the famous sort of Amazon time off task um, monitoring. Uh, so employers know, would know, right, and would hold it against you um, if you stop working for 10 minutes, um, whether you're using that time to, you know, go to the vending machine or take a phone call or talk to one of your colleagues um, about some workplace problem that you have. Um, so that kind of monitoring, right? That kind of, you know, monitoring that is used to keep workers sort of on task every moment of the workday um, also has a sort of more subtle kind of ongoing effect by making it harder for employees to get to know each other, um, to develop uh, the trust that can be a critical prerequisite to other kinds of collective action, workplace advocacy, and so on. Okay. So workplace surveillance um, and monitoring could also lower the costs to employers of workplace fissuring. Um, workplace fissuring is a term coined by David Weil, um, an academic, but also previously uh, the wage and hour administrator in the Obama administration Department of Labor. Um, workplace fissuring, right, Weil's term, uh, refers to practices that allow employers to shed legal responsibility for parts of their workforces, but also retain the services of those employees. And so fissuring might look like um, an employer, like a hotel chain, um, deciding that instead of employing cleaners directly, um, they will subcontract that part of their operation to another company. Um, fissuring might look like franchising, um, or fissuring might look like um, classifying or misclassifying employees as independent contractors. So there's a lot to say about how fissuring on average affects uh, employers' compliance with labor law. That's one of the things that Wiles specifically looks at. Um, how fissuring affects employees' pay, how it affects their opportunities for advancement, right? It's hard to get promoted up um, kind of the ladder at your workplace if you're actually employed by a separate employer that only does one thing. Um, 
And so the things we might say about workplace fishering in general um, would probably not reflect very well on fishering's effects on sort of strong labor standards, at least on average. Um, but fishing also relates to the topic of this panel um, because it is enabled by surveillance and algorithmic management. So that's because um, decisions about fishing, whether to fisher, uh, could involve trade-offs between cost effectiveness and quality control. Um, corporations might try to deal with those trade-offs by trying to ensure that they can maintain control even while right, contracting out parts of their operations. And they could do that um, in kind of a variety of ways. So, you know, creating very detailed franchise contracts that say, you know, sort of exactly how franchisees have to do various things. Um, but they can also now rely on the kind of constant detailed feedback um, that comes with, for example, um, app deployed ride hail work, right? So um, other people on this panel are really sort of experts in exactly how that works. The, you know, so there's some really sort of deep expertise about um, algorithmic management and app deployed workers. Um, but my sort of point for now is just that uh, that control um, enables companies like Uber or Lyft to simultaneously tell passengers um, that they can feel totally comfortable getting into a stranger's car um, while also maintaining that they, as companies, um, aren't the driver's employers because they don't exercise very much control over them. So that works, right? That tension gets resolved because um, Uber does exercise a lot of control over drivers. It's just that those control mechanisms um, are at least partially obscured, right? And when I say obscured, I mean not obscured to drivers, but obscured perhaps to law. Um, as an aside, I'll maybe say here that another part of what's going on here when we talk about how law thinks about or doesn't think about um, whether app deployed workers are employees or independent contractors um, is that individual arbitration clauses have proliferated in gig work contracts and they have the practical effect of making it difficult or maybe impossible um, for workers to pursue claims that they are entitled to legal protections like the minimum wage because they're actually employees and they were misclassified as independent contractors. And, you know, that issue um, gets away maybe a little bit from the core focus of this panel, but um, if people are interested, I'd be, you know, happy to talk about it um, later on. Okay, finally, uh, surveillance intersects with other labor and employment rights when employers maintain that they're using surveillance to comply with their other legal obligations. So, you know, imagine an employer saying um, that, you know, we have to monitor how employees are using or are, how employees are moving their bodies in order to sort of prevent injury. Um, we have to monitor where employees are in the facility um, to make sure that they're maintaining appropriate social distancing. Um, we have to monitor people's email to make sure people aren't sending each other harassing messages. Um, on one hand, right, technology might be generally, you know, genuinely useful um, for those purposes. Um, on the other hand, right, there's still, you know, punitive systems and employees know it. Um, and they also know that the same technology that is being deployed for these kind of purposes that are sort of consistent with law and that could potentially um, prevent injury to workers um, could also be used for other purposes, including, you know, discouraging um, time off task, right? Discouraging break time, um, discouraging uh, collective action and so on. Okay, so, so, so far we've sort of been talking about um, labor law and organizing. Um, let me shift and just briefly talk about labor law and collective bargaining. Um, and so here um, we are talking about unionized workers. So this, you know, sort of sub 10% of the private sector workforce. For, the, for that relatively small group, uh, the news is a bit brighter, 
So the implementation of surveillance or automation um, will usually be a mandatory subject of bargaining. And that means, uh, you know, employers have to come to the table with their workers bargaining representative and talk about, right, and try to come to some sort of agreement about um, whether or how those technologies will be deployed. Um, one sort of thing that means is that employers will have to disclose um, what they're doing. So that's one avenue for workers to find out um, about surveillance, right, about sort of plans for automation in the future um, and so on. And it also means that employees get a chance to argue that there should be um, guardrails in place, for example, to restrict who can access what information and for what purposes, to have a say in whether or how surveillance will be um, used to set productivity standards, um, to try to sort of strike trade-offs, right? Maybe there will be, you know, X or Y kind of surveillance or automation, um, but, you know, we'll get a raise um, as kind of an offset. Um, you can imagine all sorts of things that workers might want to have in place um, as, you know, surveillance or automation um, is being deployed. So um, at least some unions also bargain over uh, data that workers produce um, or that employers collect about workers. So, um, you know, to give one just anecdotal example, um, you know, a, a teacher's union rep um, told me that uh, his union had bargained over the use of data collected by um, third party testing companies uh, about student performance on tests. Um, so his view of things was that the union was the only entity that was really in a position to push back on that. Uh, so parents and students didn't know about it. And then the school district has, you know, its own incent its own set of incentives that may or may not be aligned with either employee interests or with parent and student interests, right? And so the union is the other party at the table that can kind of say something about that. Um, and then, uh, you know, and I guess one last thing about uh, bargaining over data collection, um, I'll just say that, you know, I, I, I think just, you know, again, sort of anecdotally, um, that unions have been kind of slow to catch on to bargaining over data collection, right? And uh, I think there's, you know, still a lot of room um, for kind of new and creative approaches for this to be something that unions really focus on. Um, on the other hand, right, unions also will usually have the right to bargain over automation, and that is much more familiar grounds, right? Unions have been bargaining over automation for, you know, probably their entire existence. Um, that can, you know, sort of like I said a minute ago, look like bargaining over how the benefits of increased productivity will be distributed. Um, it can look like just sort of opposition to automating some processes. And it can look like bargaining over the effects of automation on existing workers. Okay, so the flip side of all this um, is the emergence of collective action strategies when workers work virtually, um, work entirely virtually or partially work virtually, um, and, uh, you know, collective action strategies that are aimed at um, consumers who are not encountering a workplace by walking into a brick and mortar location. And so, uh, you know, that means thinking about, right, workers and unions are thinking about um, how to make forms of concerted activity that, you know, emerged in real life, um, like picketing, um, can be translated into new forms of work. So, of course, you know, we all know uh, the pandemic illustrated that in-person interaction is not um, mandatory for many kinds of work, um, including some categories of typically low paying jobs um, like call center work. Um, and other kinds of work might become more fully virtual as technology improves. Um, you know, workplaces might start you know, relying on the metaverse or something to facilitate what are today in-person interactions. 
And so we should ask, um, where are these workers, right? Especially where fully virtual workers who may or may not live in the same state of, as their coworkers um, will meet for these sort of both casual and more serious um, private conversations about their work and working conditions, right? Again, this is like that step, that early trust building step that is, you know, critical to any more um, sort of robust attempt to influence working conditions through collective action. So the danger, right, is that virtual work um, could make it possible for employers to create workplaces where all communication is or sort of all sort of communication within the workday, if you like, um, is mediated by technology that the employer owns. Um, and that's important because it gives employers an opening to make a legal argument that they are entitled to control how that property is used by employees. So like that's currently the rule, for example, about employer provided email addresses. So employers um, are you know, sort of allowed to say to workers, um, you can you, know, you can only use your employer, you, know, you can only use your work email address for work, or you can only use your work computer for work. Um, in contrast, though, right, the employer can't say you can only talk about work when you're on your break in the break room, um, or you can only talk about work when you're, you know, walking down the hallway to the shop floor with your coworkers. So the question can become, right, can labor law play a role in kind of constituting sort of virtual break rooms or virtual hallways, right, places where even though employees are using employer-owned technology, they have some freedom um, to um, talk about uh, things that the employer might not want them to talk about um, and whether they can do that with privacy. So for example, a labor law reform project called the Clean Slate for Worker Power um, argues that uh, you know, there should be legislation requiring employers to create digital meeting spaces for workers to be able to communicate with each other free from employer surveillance. And then, of course, you know, there's also just a, workers can use their own devices, right? They can find their own ways um, to communicate with each other. They can use their own tools or create a WhatsApp group or whatever. Um, of course, you know, assuming that they have access to, you know, their own technology, right? Sort of the including um, hardware for that. Um, technology might, uh, technology mediated work might also make strikes harder, right? Might at least call for some innovation in how workers strike. Uh, so if you envision a strike, you probably think about workers picketing outside their workplace. Um, and part of what they're doing when they do that um, is appealing to anyone who shows up, right? Don't cross the picket line. But if work is remote, then there's no opportunity to do that, right? It's hard even to know who's striking and who isn't, um, or at least it can be depending on what kind of worker we're you know, what kind of workers we're talking about and how much their work involves sort of being in a virtual space at the same time. So um, consider strikes among app deployed drivers, right? Like Uber and Lyft drivers. And, you know, those have occurred in the US in various cities on a bunch of occasions. Um, but convincing drivers to participate requires an especially high degree of trust. And, you know, that can be true of any strike, but especially um, it can be true of a strike where, um, you know, there's no picket line outside of brick and mortar workplace, right? Drivers don't know whether other drivers are really striking or not. And they lose the opportunity to have that kind of like, you know, real time opportunity to try to persuade each other, right? Don't, you know, don't work. You should strike right now. Um, you know, we should all refrain from working for some period of time. Um, the companies, though, they know who's driving and who isn't, right? They don't necessarily know why, um, but they can tell whether they've got, you know, the same kind of number of drivers at any given time in a given city that they usually have or not. Um, and they can respond um, by offering, you know, algorithmically determined premiums to non, uh, to, to drivers, right? So, um, you know, surge pricing, right? But also they can offer... Um, you know, they can set the offer 
um, you know, differently for different drivers. Um, they can also tell drivers nobody's striking, right? They can tell drivers, they can sort of tell reporters, um, you know, yeah, there was some call for a strike that, you know, went out on Twitter, um, but, you know, we know how many drivers are driving and it's the same number as always. Um, and of course, it's hard for drivers to fact check that. So a driver hears that, right? If that driver is thinking I'm in a strike today, I'm not going to drive. Um, that driver hears that and maybe they wonder, am I the only one, right? Am I losing a day's pay for basically no effect on the company? Um, the dynamics played out in other kinds of work too. Um, so, you know, academic strikes, for example, um, striking faculty and grad students have been thinking about and sort of talking about on online um, how to appeal to their colleagues um, not to cross the picket line um, when classes are being held virtually. And again, it's hard to know, right, who is striking and who isn't. So, you know, this is partially a problem about trust and it's partially a problem about communication, right? How workers communicate to each other um, about their commitment, about what they're doing. And it's possible, right, that technology can help with that. So I'm, you know, generally skeptical about, you know, here's like sort of one weird trick to fix this sort of interpersonal dynamic. Um, but we could still imagine something like a, you know, like a solidarity app. Um, that workers could download, right, that would provide a platform for non-surveilled communication, and that could possibly create um, a way for workers to kind of hold strike votes if they don't have a way to do that already. Um, and then, you know, sort of imagine that the premise of the app is that if enough workers vote in favor, for, in favor of striking, then the app locks all of its users um, out from using the struck company's technology, right? So this is, you know, downloading the app voluntarily so you're opting into this. Um, but if you know, you know, some, you know, you know 5,000 workers have downloaded this app and it's going to lock everyone out if we all vote to strike together, um, then that gives you a little bit more confidence that you're not kind of the only one staying home. Um, I, of course, am, you know, I'm a lawyer and I don't know anything about how to actually build a product like this. Um, I am just, I'm, I'm envisioning um, like those productivity apps that uh, allow you to um, lock out distracting apps and websites during um, a set period of time where you want to focus on something else. Okay, finally, this past year, we've seen um, lots of uses of digital picket line, the phrase digital picket line is kind of caught on. Um, so, you know, the um, tweet that's up on the slide, you might have seen, uh, there was a strike among New York Times workers and uh, the union and individual union members um, put out calls on social media, right, telling their readers, um, you know, please don't cross the digital picket line, explaining to them what that means, right? And you see the strike saying, here are some things you can do instead of going on the New York Times platform. Um, it's a tough strategy to implement, right? Because of the need to digitize, to, sorry, the need to publicize the digital picket line. Um, so, you know, a lot of people heard about the New York Times strike because New York Times reporters have unusually huge reach um, on social media and because um, other journalistic outlets thought the strike among journalists was interesting, and so they covered it. Um, but it's going to be a harder lift for other groups, right? So, you know, like I said, there have been strikes among, um, you know, app-deployed ride-hail drivers, right? That that gets communicated in part on social media too, right? Telling users don't use these apps. There's a strike for, you know, 24 hours on X date. Um, it's just harder uh, to get the kind of saturation that you need for consumers to know um, that that's what's going on. So there's been some call, uh, there have been, there have been some calls, um, for law to do more to accommodate and facilitate digital picket lines. Um, so, you know, the Clean Slate Project urges that struck companies should be required to post a notice. Uh, so, it, you know, if you went to newyorktimes.com on the day of the strike, 
um, you would see like a little pop-up window that tells you there's a strike going on or there's, you know, a real life picket line in front of this building. So, you know, we're telling you that so that you can make a choice about whether you want to proceed or not. Um, obviously that's not the same as an in real life picket line, right? Because uh, nobody's gonna know, right? If you click, I still wanna look at the New York Times, but it would solve some of the notice problem. On the other hand, you can imagine all sorts of, you know, especially First Amendment challenges um, under what's called com compelled speech doctrine. Um, so, you know, you can imagine the New York Times saying we shouldn't have to convey that message that we don't want to convey. Um, we, in fact, want to convey the opposite message that everybody should spend a lot of time on the New York Times platforms um, and government can't make us convey a contrary message. Um, so if that is a likely outcome of an attempt to require um, these kind of digital picket line notices, then we might also think about uh, just kind of like private, you know, solutions that unions can come up with on their own. Um, and so we might, and so that might lead us to think about things like, you know, browser extensions um, that tell users um, that they're interacting with a struck product or company. One of these actually already exists. You can download it. Um, it's fairly straightforward. Uh, if you go to, you know, a struck company website, there is a little, you know, exclamation mark that pops up at the top of your web browser. Um, so if you remember to look, at, if you remember to look, you'll see, uh, you know, that you're interacting with a struck company and you can go to a different website. Um, it seems like there's a lot of room for innovation there, uh, right? We can imagine like more, like much more effective messages uh, that a you know web browser or or an extension um, might be able to convey, right? Like it might be able to show you, you know, a picture of the actual striking workers and give you a little information about what they're striking over, right? Things like that. Um, the aside from the kind of questions about sort of what should this look like, what would the design be, how do you make it effective as a kind of piece of communications, there's also this question about how will we know what the struck companies are. Um, you might think that that would be easy to determine, uh, that there would be, for example, you know, a um, place you could go on the Department of Labor website that would tell you here are the strikes that are going on right now. Um, and although there is a, a sort of source of legal authority for um, the Bureau of Labor Statistics, which is part of the Department of Labor to collect that information, um, they actually only collect, they, they currently only publicize um, information about large strikes, right? Strikes that involve more than a thousand workers. So, um, so one role that law could play, um, even if it can't say, uh, you know, the New York Times has to pop up a little window that tells you there's a strike, um, one role that law could play would be to, you know, sort of more comprehensively collect information about what workers are asking consumers to do um, and sort of make it readily available for people who are, you know, sort of developing tools to solve the communication problem. Okay, so I'm gonna close out. Um, so, you know, technology-driven changes to work um, can both make workers more vulnerable and have consequences for how workers come together to call for better working conditions. Um, but that's not the end of the story because workers will also create new forms of collective action as we're already seeing. Um, and so with that, I will sign off for now and look forward to talking with you and the other panelists um, later this summer. Thank you for joining us. I know our participants are looking forward to live Q&A with you during your Institute panel this summer. Thank you all for watching. For more information on six Howard Mathematica, visit our website, follow us on social media, and join our email list.